Welcome to this month's installment of Brass Chats, brought to you by Monster Oil. What is this? 21 year? Hey everybody, welcome to Brass Chats. Uh, today we have a man who really doesn't need an introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, he is an expert in all things chamber. Uh, he is in St. Louis Brass. He was in the New York City Brass Quintet, sorry, the New York Brass Quintet for 18 years. He performs with Summit Brass. He's a founding member of Calliope. Uh, and if that isn't enough, he's been with the Yale University School of Music since 1989. Alan Dean. Sir. Nice to be here. Thanks. Nice to meet you. I want to I talk to you about kind of what you're famous for. Um, yeah, that's chamber music. And when I think of Alan Dean, I think of chamber music. Mm -hmm. um, how did this happen? What led you to a career in chamber? Well, uh, I spent uh, you know, those two years in Manhattan. My best friend uh, in college was a guy named Bob Heinrich. And Bob, uh, in those days, and I spent a year on the road with Fred Warren and the Pennsylvanians, who I'm sure you've, sure you've never heard of, but it was a big musical organization, very popular in those years. Spent a year on the road with him and then got drafted. So there was still a draft in those days. What year and was that? 1961. I went in, uh, Berlin Wall went up at that time, but that, you know, I got drafted. Everybody, you got drafted if you didn't stay in school or you weren't married and had kids. Sure. So my friend Heinrich was married and had kids, so he didn't get drafted, stayed in New York, and I spent two years in the Army. And when I came back in 1963, he was really very busy already. He was one of the founding members of the American Brass Quintet. And and that first year that I was there, I came back fall of 63. Sometime in early 64, he switched to the New York Brass Quintet and just walked me into the American Brass Quintet. So that was my first quintet experience. Wow. Played with them for two years, and then Bob uh, became a pilot and left the business and joined uh, Pan Am Airways and then finished with United. Um, Never liked the business. He was an unbelievable trumpet player. Yeah. Unbelievable player. He didn't like the music business. He grew so, up in Jersey, close to New York, and so. I'm sorry uh, to interrupt you. So you, you joined the military. You were in for three years. Two years. Two, two years. years. Two years. Did you get to play it? trumpet oh, while yeah, you were sure, in? No. I mean, I, I had a very tough time in the army. I was. I was supposed to go to an orchestra, the Seventh Army Symphony in Stuttgart. There was a symphony orchestra. That's the most famous yeah, sure. from World War II, right? And that, yeah, it started right after the war. And I, was, I had orders to go straight to the Seventh Army Symphony. And during basic training in Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, because I'm from the Midwest, so I got drafted in the Midwest. I'm at this god-awful place in the Ozarks in August. And I, about the fourth week, of I didn't audition for a band or anything. I had orders to go to the Seventh Army Symphony. About the fourth week, fifth week of basic, I get a, a telegram from the CEO of the orchestra, Captain Mobley. Captain Mobley said, uh, we're being disbanded for lack of string players. So that orchestra lasted from 45 until 61. Wow. And then it folded while I was in basic training, all right? Wow. So I got sent to Hawaii as a clerk typist, actually. It turns out there was a, a surplus of trumpet players in the Army, so I couldn't get a, <laughs> I couldn't get a trumpet player's MOS, no matter how well or bad you played. So I got sent to Hawaii as a clerk typist, but the band at Saint, in, in, uh, in uh, Missouri said, don't worry, there, there are two army bands in Hawaii. Once you get there, you'll get into a band, which I did eventually. Okay. So I spent two years in tough duty in Hawaii uh, in an infantry division. I'm so sorry. Played in a wonderful little jazz group most of the time. Uh, uh, I was not in the division band. I was in a sort of an unauthorized esprit de corps type band, <laughs> but as a result, we toured all over the Far East, had a quintet, really good players, a good rhythm section and tenor player, and we played, you know, uh, this was just pre-Vietnam, pre-war, right, 61 to 63. We played, you know, we played in Saigon before the war, which was like a little Paris in the middle of the jungle. We played in Bangkok, we played in Seoul, we played in, it was, a, it was great duty. That's awesome. Then, I, you know, when I came out of the Army in 63, after two years, I called my friend Heinrich. And a guy you might have heard of, Dominic Spera. Do you know that name? Dominic just retired from Indiana a few years ago, but oh. a, a bunch of jazz arrangements that Dominic did. I also met him at the Manhattan School, and we did. Uh, uh, when I came back, he was doing shows and was getting busy uh, in New York. Those two guys, both of whom I met at Manhattan, started me in the business. I had a Broadway show within two months after I got back to New York oh, you know, wow. because, because of Dominic. And then Bob walked me into the American Quintet, then he became a pilot, and I switched to the New York Quintet. So let me get this straight, you were, you were in the Army, 
you play Broadway. You have played every period instrument that exists on, that, on trumpet. That, Ish, the trumpet family. Yeah, yeah. Just about. Yeah, but uh, I'm not. A, <laughs> okay. I was never. I'd never had a great affinity for the baroque trumpet, for the you know the natural trumpet. I had them. I got a bunch of them here. I forced my kids to play them, but uh, f uh, I, I somehow got into the recorder. Uh, about 1966 or so, it, Baroque music was just getting popular. Like all of a sudden, it wasn't just Bach and Handel. You know, Vivaldi was on the scene, and you know, other composers. And I loved that music. And I get a little bored with the trumpet sometimes. So, so I, I started playing recording. Can't show that. And just all suddenly, I, I, you know, I got I could play reasonably well, and I got so that I could play a you know a Handel sonata, and I could play a slow movement, and it was like wasn't killing my face on the piccolo trumpet. <laughs> it was like a beautiful instrument. Well, so this is interesting. I got a question. What, and that's what got me to the cornetto, actually, originally. Oh, wow, yeah. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because you've done so much of this, I mean, like you said, you played cornetto. I saw a video of you online playing a Civil War rotary. Uh, I, don't, I can't remember what you call it, but it's mm -hmm. somewhere between a bass <laughs> trumpet and a rotary trumpet. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you tell us what effect your experience with all these styles and instruments uh, has had on you as a musician? Well, um, I mean, I, you know, I've been playing the trumpet for 67 years now, and, and I've, I love the trumpet, I love the instrument. I'm not always the biggest fan of its literature, but I, but I do love the instrument. But starting on the recorder, um, then going to cornetto, and then broke trumpet, uh, uh, Ray Mason and I were the only two guys in New York playing cornetto and brogue trumpet in the you know, late 60s, early 70s. Um, I think more than anything, that diversion from the trumpet has kept me really interested in the trumpet, I, you know, whereas I would, might have gotten burned out somehow yeah. on the trumpet. But having all these other instruments, all this music, I mean, I didn't like music history in college any more than anybody did, but suddenly I was playing these instruments, um, opened up a whole new world of pre-1650, music that I knew nothing about, you know, Renaissance music, which is still, along with jazz, my favorite music is pre-Baroque music. It's just fantastic stuff. And that just opened up a, musically a whole world to me. Somehow. So, for, I mean, just most of the people that watch these videos, most people in general are never going to even come close to playing something pre-1700, whatever, all mm -hmm. these things that you're talking about. Um, if you could pick three pieces for the uh, average Joe, average trumpet player that doesn't dabble in these areas, uh, three pieces for them to expand their repertoire, what would they be? Well, most everybody, if they've done any quintet playing, has played dances of Susado, dances of Pretorius, uh, uh, Holborn, Anthony Holborn. These are all around 1600, just before or after. And any, any of that music, there are 64 wonderful five-part pieces by Holborn, that, that's great stuff. There's you know, in terms of solo literature, there's uh, um, like Frescobaldi uh, uh, sonatas, canzonas for solo instrument and, and continuo that are wonderful pieces. Jerry Schwartz recorded uh, Frescobaldi and Fontana, first recording he made back in the 60s. But he was like eight years that, old, right? That music. He was probably well, eight and a half years old. Probably yeah. 18, yeah. Okay. <laughs> 17 or 18. But that, you know, I mean, that's, that's just great, great music of which there's tons of it, and uh, and you know you don't have to play Andre transcriptions of a Marcello sonata. You know there's like a lot of real music. Actual stuff. <laughs> you know, cool. granted, before that it wasn't trumpet music. Maybe it was played on the recorder, played other. You know, instruments were not dictated yeah. before 1600 very much. So it's just great music, and you play it on whatever instruments. Cool. And the trumpet, it sounds very good on the trumpet. Well, well thanks for those recommendations. Yeah. <laughs> Um, let's move on to your teaching style. Um, can you tell us how you go about getting to know your students? Obviously, they have individual needs. How do you uh, get to know when you're st one of your students? Well, I'm really lucky here at Yale. I have a grand total of six students, and they're all graduate students. So, and, and when I left New York in, uh, in 1982, I went to Indiana. I taught in Bloomington for seven years, which is a great music school. Um, but I was teaching, um, I think I got up to 24 students one semester. Uh, you know, there were, there were 90 trumpet players at Indiana at that <laughs> point. There were three teachers, but just unbelievable number of trumpets there. And I love Bloomington. The tennis was very good there, which is my other... Did you say the tennis? The tennis was very good in Bloomington. Yeah, that's my other main interest. <laughs> and, uh, 
and it's a big jock school, obviously, and so it was great from that standpoint. It's a beautiful campus, beautiful music school, but it's huge. Yeah. And this job came along after seven years in Bloomington, just when I was ready to get a sabbatical and take a semester or a year off. I quit and took this job, uh, which is really an adjunct job, but it's, I teach uh, 12 to 14 hours. And so, uh, I've been here for 29, this is my 29th oh, year now. Oh, that's so. awesome. Can you talk about what it is like chasing a career in music today versus maybe before you were successful? How is it different today? I, there's almost no comparison except for an orchestra job, which the audition routine has changed a bit, but that's still basically the same except now there are 120 people at every audition instead of 20 uh, during my era probably. But that, that really hasn't changed a lot. What's really changed is the nature of, of what I would call the freelance business. Uh, you know, that doesn't exist in New York and LA and Chicago the way it did when I started. And that's just totally changed. Meaning There's it was far larger. It wasn't larger. There weren't near as many players, and there was. Uh, uh, there's probably just as much work now as there was in the 50s and the 60s when I started. But there's so many more players trying to get it. You know. So, so you know, yeah. I mean, there was all this. You know, when I came to New York, I, 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 I really wanted to be a. That's what I thought I wanted to be was a studio player. I knew. I mean, I played some jazz, but I came. I heard. Uh, I heard Lee Morgan play within the first two months I was in New York at Slugs. Said, okay, you're not a jazz player, right? So <laughs> that, that ended. So back to the practice room. Took it, took it, too, you know, and to, back to that. Then, uh, and then I heard all these commercial guys. You know, Bernie Glow was probably names you've never heard of, but Bernie Glow was first call in New York. Marky Markowitz, Mal Davis. You know, Doc was uh, not first call really when I first came to New York. I mean, you know, he was one one of the guys. Wow. And. Uh, I listened to these, they, they could all play an octave higher than me, could play twice as loud <laughs> as me, and, and they were 10 years older. Doc's 10 years older than me, right? Just turned 89, you know, I'm 78, almost 79. And, and I said, I'm not gonna put these guys out of work, you know, come on. You know. So that whole idea of being a studio player kind of went out the window too. So then I just did different tracks. I got a Broadway show, I started the Brass Quintet World. I never took a steady job. I mean, I've managed to be in New York for, well, counting school, 25 years, but really 20 years playing professionally, and I never had any desire to play in the ballet orchestra. To, to I, I, you know, it was just the phone kept ringing. It was just a great existence. It was fantastic. So you would say basically the freelance scene is is parallel to what's happening in the orchestral scene. It's it's just more competition. More people are better. Mm, more than anything, at, and at it's, what they do. you know the studio business is basically down the tubes. I mean the recording business is hardly exists anymore, and that was the main work for an awful lot Street, of the, yeah. the best players. The best players are now playing Broadway. I mean, there's still a little bit of recording going on here and there, I think, but I've been out of that loop for really since 1982. So, <laughs> But I have kids. I have like five, six, seven students in New York now who graduated in the last five years, and they're finding a way. You know, they're all living in Brooklyn or Washington Heights, and they're, you know, I don't know if they'll still be there when they're 35 or 40, but when they're 25 or 30, they're still there, and there's no place like it. New York's the greatest city in the world. <laughs> the greatest musicians are there. There's so much going on, but there's not quite uh, that phone ringing and um, you know pay the rent kind of gigs that were there when I was there. You know? Here, here's a good question for you, because it sounds like you've experienced a lot of students going trying trying to make it. Mm -hmm. um, what does it take today to make it? Do you, what does your life have to be like? Do you is, is, is do you have to live and breathe trumpet to win a job? Do you have to mm. to do push-ups with your <laughs> mouthpiece on your? I I don't know what well, what do you have to do today because it's just uh, so much harder. Yeah, it's harder, uh, and and you're not going to succeed unless you're a good player. So you know you you you've got to pay your dues, and and work on the things you can't do and just you know become a good player. High chops, low chops, fast tongue, slow tongue, all the things that you have to do to be a player. But musically, um, if you're just myopic orchestra and that's all you want to do and think you want to do, then, you know, which I certainly don't encourage, I don't, because there's hardly any work. <laughs> I mean, you know, there just hardly exists as well. But that's kind of been the conservatory approach at every school, they hire the first trumpet from the major symphony to come and teach, and the, you know that the, those are the teachers. The thing I love about this school is that there's nobody on our faculty that's orchestrally oriented. Uh, the only exception is the tuba player, 
Yes, sir. Well, Car Carol, Carol yeah. yeah. But that's it. Uh, Toby Hanks taught here for 35 years, uh, who's the tuba player in the New York Quintet. And the other guys in the quintet were all on the faculty here. Bob Nagel was my predecessor, uh, Paul Ingram and John Swallow. But such a small school, there was never need for two trumpets. I'd come and play concerts uh, with the New York Brass Quintet, but, but there was never a job here for me. So Bob taught here for 31 years, I think. And the day he retired, uh, uh, I got a call from the other guys on the faculty here and the dean saying, you interested in coming to Yale, assuming I wouldn't give up a tenured professorship to take an adjunct job, you know, but without hesitation, I took the job. Awesome. Two things. One is it gave me a chance to live. I have a beautiful house in the Berkshires, an hour and a half north of here, <laughs> which I've had since the 70s, and it has a tennis court and, and a few things. Oh, yeah, so, always first, about thing, first things first, you know. <laughs> and, and it gave me a chance to, you know, to do this job and, and you know, teach six students instead of 25. Yeah. And all great students. We're very lucky to get a fantastic $100 million grant about 10 years ago, so everybody goes to school free. Everybody gets a $4,000 stipend on top of that, and there's enough work study and stuff here that nobody pays to go to school. That's great. So, I, you know, I still going to lose a student to Juilliard. I'm going to lose a student to Barbara and Charlie at Rice or something, you know, but basically we're getting great students, and um, I don't have to go out and recruit. <laughs> so well, it's a great job. It's a great job. You kind of touched on something that uh, your friend and colleague Mark Gould did. Uh, and he talked about the emphasis on creativity. And to hear you say that one of your six students is interested in an orchestral career as their first choice um, means that you have creative students because they're not, they're, they're not going the, uh, the typical route. Yeah, mostly, so, they, mostly they don't, I'd say. Um, one, of, one of the kids who came here went to Oberlin, went to Juilliard for a master's. He's here for a post-master's degree. He's totally in electronics. Uh, he's, he's, played three uh, electric, electronic things that he's doing, learning to program and do stuff electronically, and then composing, you know, trumpet along with the electronics. Um, that would make you significantly more, significantly more marketable. Well, if, if you yeah, were able so that's, to. you know, who knows, but that's, that's his interest. Uh, another boy is a um, great trumpet player, also came from Juilliard, who's like in doing, um, uh, he's writing an etude book of, of improvised kind of thing, sort of like a, on a lesser scale than what Peter Evans, who's coming this week to do a class on that on that uh, uh, level, he's just into that. The orchestra guy, uh, that's what he's doing, and that's his interest. But he spent a summer at Aspen with the brass quintet from Curtis. I mean, he's not totally cool. myopic, you know. He's, but I just think in this day and age, the more you can do, uh, the better chance you've got to make on a living. The best freelance business in the world may be in Des Moines. You know, or Oklahoma City or something, you know, because there's a freelance business in that town, too. You know, you go there, if there's not a quintet to play kids' concerts, you form a quintet. You play in the local orchestra, which probably has, you know, six pairs of concerts a year or something, you know, whatever. That. And you've got, you know, hopefully you've got a college job. <laughs> the best freelance gig in the world is a college job. <laughs> I mean, you get a college job, you're based in a place, hopefully you're close enough to a city where there's an orchestra to play in. There's hopefully colleagues that you can play chamber music with. And you've got a home based salary, you know, Teach which, is, which is great. But just you got to be versatile in this day and age and even to get a good college job. You can't just go play excerpts when you go to college. You better be able to play solos. You better, if you've, you've got a little early music, if you can play jazz, if you can do, you know, all those things make you much more saleable. What are your first notes like every single day? <laughs> I have a great story because what we all got our warm up right and we go out and we start on second line G right you know, so. when I was in college <clears throat> there was a wonderful teacher I was at the University of Iowa <clears throat> excuse me and there was a wonderful teacher in Minneapolis named Dan Tetzlaff who had studied with Jacobs and was and, and he was well known in the Midwest so I went up to take a lesson from him my teacher at Iowa suggested I go see Dan Tetzlaff for a lesson so I woke up Dan was like a very brilliant you know straight ahead guy he opens the, opens the door and says, come here, you got to listen to this. And so he takes me to the back room, and he's playing uh, Gazzo's Trumpeter's Prayer. Do you know, anybody know Trumpeter's Prayer of Conrad Gazzo? You know who Conrad Gazzo is, right? The great lead player of all time in the West Coast, the best lead player. <clears throat> Did all the Sinatra records, all the Nelson Riddle things, great player. You know, he recorded this thing called Trumpeter's Prayer, which is really hokey with the choir in the back and the thing, but it's just absolutely gorgeous trumpet playing. So here's this legit guy who holds me in the back to hear Gaz play, you know, this unbelievable ballad, Trumpeter's Prayer. Then I go to play for him, I pick up the horn, and I, you know, so he said, well, you know, warm up a little bit. So I go, the second line, he says, come on, you're a big boy now, you can start on C. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, pro 
probably still start on G. But, 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 uh, do you still start on G? Yeah, I probably do, yeah. Well, start on G? I, I play the mouthpiece a little bit, you know, and then I don't have a specific routine that I do necessarily, but okay. I probably kind of do the same stuff for the first half hour. But What's your first hour mostly focused on, first half hour well, focused on? Well, you know, I, I, I start by just spreading the, you know, I start on that middle G and I work low G to high G and then just doing chromatics and, uh, and you know, kind of poor man's stamp or something of that nature, right? And then I get myself to high C and low F sharp. And then I do some, I do some bends, I do some pedal tones. I've gotten into doing the kind of a pseudo maggio. Anybody ever heard of the maggio system, pedal tone system? All right, so that's another thing you should know about. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, maggio was you know, like the big uh, West Coast teacher prior to Jimmy Stamp. And, uh, and he was totally into, into pedal tones. I've never been a big pedal tone player, but in my old age, I'm finding that uh, I mean, the trumpet's always been easy for me to play. I play good, I play bad, but it's always easy to play. That, and, I mean, uh, that, actually, that's a question I have on here. Um, something people respect when they hear you play trumpet is how easy it is. Why is it easy? Why does it sound easy? Why does it look easy for you? Well, you know it's not that easy. I mean, that's the nature of the trumpet a little bit. So I, first place, I have very sloppy posture when I play. Uh, kind of, you know, that's, that's my way of <laughs> staying relaxed. You know, everybody says, well, you look so easy when you play. That's nonsense. Well, how do you sound so easy? That's what's well, more important anyway. That's, I, uh, I probably I don't think too much about playing. I just think about the music. And, and uh, I mean, the only reason I play the trumpet is to play music. I don't play the trumpet to play the trumpet. That's why I play the recorder. That's why I play the cornetto. That's why I play the alto sax. That's why I play the show. It's just to play music. And the and trumpet happens to be one of the things that I probably do better than the others, but still. So it's just you know, an extension of your musicianship. I, I hope so. I hope so, basically. And so, you know, you pay your dues and you practice and, and you do what you got to do and do, you know, fundamental-ish sort of stuff for, for 30, <laughs> 30 minutes, but I have to admit I'm watching the news or, uh, <laughs> or something a lot of Do you of the do fundamentals in front oh, of ESPN? Yeah. Yeah, that's terrible, but I do. Chris <laughs> Martin. Chris <laughs> Martin does it too. Is that right? ESPN, yeah. is what he yeah. said. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, that's uh, what news been program? On auto, automatic, MSNBC, Fox a, News, which one? Uh, uh, CNBC and uh, Fox uh, News. You kidding? Fox <laughs> News? Come on! <laughs> You're talking to a left-wing liberal from. Uh, from well, I was going to say the like, safe answer, is CNN, yeah. and you didn't go yeah. any of those. No, I have to watch uh, watch MSNBC, and uh, but I do watch some sports and the Tennis Channel and some things like that. But okay. yeah, I have to admit, I do I do that, and then. I do uh, a half hour, usually if I'm just practicing, which now I'm not playing that many concerts, just with the brass quintet. We have a trio here, um, some early music concerts, but not a lot at this point. So I'm practicing much more than I ever did when I was playing all the time. Okay. So I play etudes for a half an hour usually, big etude player. So and right now I'm going through Chris Gecker's 24 etudes. They're, they're, they're fantastic etudes, I think. Uh, um, you know, I still play out of the old classics and, uh, yeah. you know, I, I've got a stack of etude books and I've, I've got the up and down the horn books, you know, the Brandt book and the Werner book and the Worm and, you know, playing up and down the horn. And then I got some, you know, Van Edelbosch and Charlie and more musical stuff, Phil Snedeker's book, stuff like that. And I just keep putting stuff on the stand to stay interested, you know. So. Mm. Then the next half hour I'll play uh, stuff I don't know or stuff I have coming up. I have a quintet tour coming up in a couple of weeks and so I, you know, I touch some of that stuff. We play things memorized, a lot of things, so I have to kind of recoup my old mind and remember what we did last spring because we haven't been on tour since last sure. March. So, um, so it sounds like about a third to a fourth of what you do is a fundamental-ish and the rest of it is music. Uh, a fourth maximum. Basically. Fourth maximum. Because I try yeah. to do two hours a day and the last, hour, last half hour is playing Abersol. Usually, you know, nice. <laughs> just, just playing jazz. <laughs> Bad jazz, but jazz. You know, I, mean, I, I love jazz. I don't pretend to be a great player. I don't really study, but I love playing. I'm playing a lot more piano, and I'm back trying to learn. I, I got to tell you, you just played, you just played chameleon on cornetto. Well, I think you yeah. just you expanded the genre. That's so. probably the first time I've ever played jazz on the cornetto. So. <laughs> well, with my old group with Calliope, we did a little bit of a. Of a the last record we did was called Calliope Swings, a little bit of. You know, a little bit of quasi jazz, but I want to know when you were developing yourself as a player, uh, which trumpet players you idolized, who uh, formed you into the player that you are. Well, as a as a young player, uh, I listened to. It's weird that I end up in New York because I listened strictly to West Coast jazz. So uh, players you may or may not have heard of. I love Don Fagerquist. You probably never heard of him. Uh, You've heard him? Yeah. <laughs> you know him all too well. We know uh, I think it was uh, the interview. Uh, 
Talk about Saunders? Yeah, Carl Saunders. Oh, Carl, Carl yeah, we, sure. We did Carl yeah, Saunders. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. Federicus was, was on Les Brown's band when I first heard him, but, and he played with Dave Pell's octet and stuff. I mean, a really tasty, very tasty player. And, you know, I, um, Chet Baker and Shorty Rogers, those are the guys I grew up with, you know. So when I came to New York and heard, you know, for the first time and heard Lee Morgan, I'd heard some records, but not, I wasn't into it that much. And I heard him play, I heard Kenny Doran play, I said, wow, I don't play jazz. You know, it was just, you know, I was still playing right note, West Coast jazz, you know. And these guys set me on a different different path, you know, Blue Mitchell, guys like this, what players, you know. Wow. So that, those, were, those were my jazz idols, first West Coast guys when I was a kid and then the East Coast guys when I got here. I didn't listen to classical music much. Uh, we had my two older brothers who are eight and ten years older were both strictly into jazz and my parents were strictly classical so there was that uh, schism in the household there, you know, so we didn't listen to much classical music. That's amazing. I just, yeah. I, this is not an insult or a compliment, so don't take this <laughs> anyway. But uh, when, when I hear your sound, when I hear you play, I've only really listened to mostly of your, class, your classical things. Mm -hmm. I immediately think like legit classical treble player. Mm -hmm. Sorry, mm -hmm. legit kind of insulting we found out mm -hmm. when we interviewed Carl Saunders, so I'm just going to say <laughs> classical. Yeah. But, but yeah, I guess that's that cornet background that you have well, that really probably, probably is in a warm way, sound. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, the, the, the classical players, I mean, I, I grew up listening to Rafael Mendez. I met him. I took some lessons. I mean, I had two or three lessons when he was touring around the Midwest that, in the fifties. And you also teach at the Mendez Institute. Yeah, I, did, I right? just retired this year. I did uh, thirty-one years. I've been there. So wow. this this was my last summer with the Mendez thing. It Gosh. interferes with my summer travels to Europe. <laughs> no, not really. It was a great experience and it was fun. But it's you know, it's a big brass ensemble. It's heavy duty. It's it's time for new blood in that trumpet section. So it was it was time. But that's you know that was great. But Rafael was was after his uh, studio days and he was touring around all these little bands playing solos all over the Midwest and stuff and uh, so I met him and, uh, I played a solo at the Midwest Bandmasters Clinic in 1955 or 6 and uh, he was there and he heard me play and I was playing old cornet you know and so forth so he, he was an old instrument player you know so he got me down there so I, and then he came through and I got to take two or three lessons with him you know and I'd, <laughs> I'd, I'd Play something for him, and he'd say, oh, "I said that that's very good." He says, uh, uh, "You know, so maybe your sound's a little too dull, and um, you know, use more vibrato." I said, well, "Okay." So yeah, he says, "Can we can we talk about tonguing?" And he said, "You know, because he's the most <laughs> unbelievable tongue you ever heard, Rafael Mendez, right?" He said, "Oh, forget it. You're never going to tongue as fast as me. I speak Spanish." <laughs> so so, so, he, so he, he really wouldn't talk about tonguing very much. Yeah. So now you're fluent in Spanish. Yeah, no, no. I study Italian, but not Spanish. <laughs> but that, so I suppose he was an idol in a way. But you know, I'm of an era where you know Harry James was was the idol in, in many yeah. ways in terms of you know kind of big bandish guys pre Maynard, oh, yeah. pre pre the high note players. You know, the high high notes were high E flats in those days. You know, that was. But that was, a, uh, I guess you know more of a commercial. Upbringing, I didn't really yeah. do any transposition until I went to college and discovered, well, I guess you have to do I didn't buy a seed trumpet until my second year of college, probably. Yeah. Okay. So it was never the top of my list, and I never really wanted to play in a symphony. And so even when I discovered I wasn't going to make a living as a studio player, I still was not ever going to take orchestra auditions. It was not my interest. Yeah. So, no. um, this is also a question we ask people a lot. Uh, can you describe the greatest musical experience of your life? No. <laughs> How about the second best? No, no. I mean, there's no. There hasn't been like one enlightening moment for me. But well, let me rephrase the question. How has music uh, affected your life in general? Uh, what? Well, are you? I mean, it's it's you no. Know, I it it is your life when you. I mean, it becomes your life in so many ways. But for me. The trumpet is not the most important thing in my life. Um, I stand healthy, I meditate, I do yoga every day, I, I uh, uh, have a family, I have a daughter. I had my first kid when I was 55, wow. uh, which is, you know, I've had a few marriages but never had any kids. And finally had a daughter uh, who's fantastic, now a senior in college. That's changed. I mean, it's, it's just a whole other part of life that's, that's fantastic. And music's, you know, I listen, I play, I've been, I mean, you know, the trumpet has been incredibly good to me that I've, if you'd have told me when I was 18 that I'd make a living playing the trumpet for the next 50 years, I said, come on, you know, I mean, this, is, this is a gift, I'm not religious, but I said, this is a gift from somewhere, you know. 
and it's treated me uh, unbelievably well. So I, you know, count my blessings in many ways. So you know, all right, what do you say? Music, you know. I, I, but I look back. I've toured most of the world, playing the stupid trumpet. You know, playing with quintets, <laughs> playing with contemporary music ensembles, playing with early music ensembles. It's it's. I mean, music is is it's your life in so many ways. You know, and tennis is second. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Alan. Yeah. So I told you about this. This is the monster round. Yeah. Good luck. Uh, I, I, I assume you know what it is, but we have. This works. It's up to you. Yeah. Wait, am I? Hey, how about you be quiet? I'm running this interview, all right? No, no, no. Um, so, in case you don't know, the Monster Round is a series of rapid fire questions. And uh, yeah, so there's no cash prizes or. I, I, I don't know. So, this is the Monster Round, Alan Dean style. Okay. What B flat trumpet do you play most? Mm -hmm. I play Yamaha. Of course. Yes or no? Have you ever practiced while driving a car? Um, yes. Long tones, yes or no? Um, uh, some long tones because I do a breathing exercise every day that involves long tones. Best flexibility exercise? Uh, 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 I'm not a big fan of flexibility exercises. I do Schlossberg for 20 minutes and I'm stiff as a board. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite composer of all time? Bach. Most influential composer of all time? Bach. Why did you say Bob is your favorite? I was hoping they'd be. Uh, best trumpet player of all time. Oh, boy. No, there's no, I, I can't really say. Most influential trumpet player of all time. Well, I can't say that either. There have been so many. I mean, you know, you could, I mean, you're going to say orchestral, you're going to say chamber music. You know, I mean, Bob Nagel is Mr. Brass Quintet, right? I mean, he's been the most influential guy in brass quintets. I mean, he just passed away, but he started the whole thing. I mean, before Europe, I mean, he was, he was the guy. Orchestrally, I mean, what are you going to say? You're going to say, you got to say Herseth probably. For me, it was really Bill Vacchiano, who I heard. My teacher was Nat Prager, who was the second player in the Philharmonic. So the, the years I was in, in, the, in New York City, I went to every Philharmonic concert Bernstein was conducting in the late 50s. And Bill and, and Nat were the trumpet section. And, you know, I listen to it now and say, well, I, there's some things he did that I probably, you know, wouldn't quite approve of now, but he was the most beautiful down home. Italian trumpet yeah. player, absolutely beautiful, and my teacher was right there playing, Your favorite? playing the B flat trumpet with him. <laughs> <laughs> Your favorite brass quintet piece? I'd probably have, because it's treated me so well, I'd have to say the Malcolm Arnold, just because it was written for our group and I must have played it 250 times, and I got to play first trumpet on that piece, and they go let me play first on that piece. <laughs> <laughs> Next to any brass quintet you've been a part of, who's your favorite to listen to? Other than brass quintets? Oh, your favorite uh, brass quintet. Favorite brass quintet. Excluding the ones you've been a part yeah, of. I don't listen to brass quintet. Have you ever eaten <laughs> a McRib sandwich? <laughs> no, I've never had one. I don't go near McDonald's. <laughs> Who's your favorite singer? Uh, I, I go back to days when I listened to June Christie and, uh, you know, the, that school, Sarah Vaughan, you know, probably if I listen just in the car, I probably listen to Sarah Vaughan more than anybody. Your favorite Carmen period? Carmen McRae. <laughs> Who was that last one? Carmen McRae. Oh, yeah. Your favorite period instrument to play? Uh, the cornetto. Yeah. You're on an undiscovered island with unlimited food and water. What three things do you bring with you to improve your trumpet playing? <laughs> uh, for starters, I wouldn't have a trumpet with me. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. But, you know, he'd bring a mouthpiece. He'd bring another mouthpiece. And, and, <laughs> three mouthpieces. And, 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 and maybe, maybe a trumpet you know, or a burp. <laughs> the best sports moment of all time? Um, when I get a good uh, backhand down the line. <laughs> You're in a time machine. Where do you go? Where do I go? Italy. Italy, without a question. Stamp or Chickowitz? Uh, I probably do a little bit of stamp, but I do a lot of things that you would call flow studies, but they're not actually Vince's studies particularly, and I don't really do stamp either, but I, but I, I like a lot of things that he had to say, and, and, and uh, it, was, it was great. He just wasn't the New York guy. Carmine Caruso was the New York guy. I never studied with him either, but, but Carmine was the East Coast guy, and Jim, Jimmy was the West Coast guy, and they were the gurus. And they were both, I mean, very charismatic guys. I saw Carmine talk people into playing. They'd go in, couldn't play a note, and come out 30 minutes later playing, you know? I mean, Carmine had that kind of man. He played the tenor sax. He wasn't even a trumpet player. But he was a shrink, and, and he could talk people into playing. I'm sure from everything I've heard from Stamp, he's the same way. So. 
If you had to be a trumpet player in the Civil War or the American Revolution, which one would you choose and why? Hmm? I'd choose the Revolution because I have a better chance of staying alive. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, I'm more interested. Actually, I'm, big, I'm a big war fan. I read a lot about wars. You're so, a big war fan? Well, I, war I fan. love <laughs> war fan. No, warfare and for my heart. And then, <laughs> that's cool to do. But uh, I've, I've, I went back and have, have kind of read histories of you know, starting with the Revolutionary War and going through 1812 and the Civil War. And I find that fascinating, First, Second World War. So you had a better chance in the Revolution, though, of making it You had a better chance to stay alive, yeah. Your biggest influence outside of music? Tennis. Your favorite place on earth? Uh, almost anywhere in Italy. Music to be played at your funeral? Uh, I don't plan to have a funeral. My ashes will be thrown off a mountain behind our house. Oh, I thought you were going to say <laughs> you're going to live forever, and then I was just going to like, this is, well, I'm, 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 working, I'm working on that, but I, <laughs> I, some, I have the vague feeling that it's going to catch up with me some, somewhere along the way. My mother lived to 100, however, so wow. I, still, I figure i got another 25, 30 years to go. <laughs> What's your favorite place to play the trumpet? Favorite place to play the trumpet? In my wife's studio. My wife's a wonderful painter. She's an artist, and uh, presently in a three-week residency down in Virginia. And... And she has a beautiful big studio, 20 by 30, with cathedral ceilings with the skylights and stuff. Wow. I'm not allowed in there, but right now she's <laughs> gone for three weeks, so, so I go in there and play a little bit. So she's going to see this. Play. You know this. That's yeah. probably true, but, uh, uh, but when she comes back, I'm never allowed in again, so it's all right. All right, last question. Yes. The number one reason you are a musician? Um, one, probably because I never really had another choice. From day one, I was, on, I was interested in journalism. I, that was, would have been my second choice. It pays even worse than the music business, so I think I, <laughs> that may have had something to do with it. But from the time I started college in Iowa, there was uh, uh, really no question. I, I thought I might end up in a high school band director. I had no idea, but it was going to be in music. My whole family it was an avocation. My father put me on the airplane on Ozark Airlines to go to New York in 1958. And uh, he well, was a. Do you, do you guys remember the DC threes, which was an old plane that the tail was on the ground? Or Ozark Airlines, right? So my dad takes me out to the airport in Mason City, Iowa, and he shakes my hand and he says, "Well, good luck in the music business, son, but I like to eat myself." <laughs> so that was, everybody in my family loved music. I, I was not the best musician in my family. I think maybe my dad was. My mother was a wonderful player. Both my older brothers, who are now both gone, but fantastic musicians, and, but that was always a hobby. And you know, they probably loved music more than I do in a way. I mean, they really loved music, loved playing. So family? Yeah, really. Family, that's the, yeah, yeah, that's the very regime musician. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Alan Dean, thanks for your time. My pleasure, thank you. Enjoyed it. My pleasure. <laughs>